One week from Christmas. Can you believe it? Just over one week from Christmas. It's hard to believe, isn't it, that we're, we're that close. What a crazy and kind of hectic time of the year. I mean, there's, there's programs to come to and recitals, and if you have kids in school, they have projects to finish and tests coming up before uh, Christmas break starts. At work, you have holiday parties, and, and you have business that needs con- concluded before the end of the calendar year. You have family gatherings and social gatherings. You have presents to buy and presents to wrap, and, and just such a busy, crazy time of the year. And it's ironic that all that Christmas and this busiest time of the year for most of us is all centered on Jesus, who was prophesied as being known, one of the names Isaiah said he would be known by is the Prince of Peace. And so isn't it ironic that all, everything we celebrate is for the Prince of Peace, and this time of the year is probably the least peaceful time of the year for most of us. It's ironic it's that way. And we live in a world that is craving peace. Like people are hungry for it. People are desperate to find to make sense of things and to, and to have peace in the midst of, of chaos. And, and we live in a world where your peace can get robbed from you in just seconds. Like right, right now, any of you could get a text message that would totally derail your day, maybe your week, maybe this, this whole month, right? And, and it just robs you of your peace. Many of us, the first thing we do in the morning is why we wake up, we roll over, we pull this out, Right? And we check text messages, and we check, check, check the news headlines, and we check the tweets, and we see, you know, what the emails we have from our boss, and, and we look at our Facebook post from yesterday, at who commented on it, or, or we look at the likes and, and wonder why those people didn't like it, right? And like right from the beginning of the day, our peace is taken away from us. It's robbed. And then you go to work, and there's difficult coworkers and managers, and school, there's, there's gossip and challenges and family stuff. And, 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 and then all throughout the day, we just live in the state of, of not having peace. And today, I, I, wanna, I want us to focus on the Prince of Peace, because Jesus really, he lived up to his name. He really did. And maybe you're here, and you're not a follower of Jesus and that's okay. I, I'm really glad you're here. Maybe you're here checking things out. Maybe someone nags you to come. Maybe you came to see a, 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 a grandchild or a child or a friend's child in the Christmas program. Whatever reason you might be here, if you're not a follower of Jesus, we welcome you. Vineyard Life Church has always been and will always be a place that's safe and welcoming to those that are questioning, those that are searching, those that are doubting. Maybe you're skeptical. And so this whole conversation of peace gives you some insight. It pulls back the curtain a little bit on what you will have access to once you step across the line of faith. And for those of us that are followers of Jesus, this tells us what we already have access to, and maybe we've just not been living it out. And so if you have your Bibles, turn on your Bibles, check out your, or take out your Bibles. We're going to be hanging out in Matthew chapter 6, the very first book in the New Testament, Matthew chapter 6, because Jesus has some things to say about peace and some things to say about the opposite of peace, which is worry. Now Jesus, what amazes me about his life, and maybe you've not read the Gospels or you don't know much about how Jesus lived his life, but, but he was constantly being bombarded by friends and by enemies. He was constantly facing challenges and, and obstacles and criticism from people, and people were attacking him and accusing him all throughout his ministry. Maybe you deal with some of that with your family or, or with work. He was facing sickness, and he faced death, and there were storms, and there was weddings in crisis, and friend, loved ones died. Yet in the midst of all of that, he operated and maintained a level of peace. It was like there was no room for fear. There was no room for worry in his life. And I don't know about you, but I want to live that way. Because I live in a crazy, chaotic world, and you do too. Is it really possible to live like Jesus lived, and I, and I would suggest to you it is. So check this out. This is in Matthew 6. So Jesus talks about the opposite of peace, and I think he gives us insight into what he understood and he wants us to understand. So check this out. This is Matthew 6, verse 25. It starts out and says, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life or what you will eat or drink or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? No, but you can take off some, hour, take off some hours, can't you? Right? Like you can, you can lose, I mean, stress and anxiety and worry. They, they can take off not only hours, but days and even years. And that's been proven. And so this, this thing of peace isn't just a, a nice church Christmas topic. It's not just a spiritual thing. It's not even just an emotional thing. Actually, this has real physical implications in your life. 
Like, if you figure this out, you could actually live longer, right? Like, that's, that's what science has shown us. Verse 28, and why do you worry about clothes? We'll come back to that question. Why do you worry? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin, and yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that's how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? If Jesus, if Jesus is saying if God does all that for like a piece of grass, or a flower, or a bird, like if he cares for that part, those parts of his creation and meets all their needs, imagine what he wants to do and what he can do for you because you're so much more valuable. God looks at you and, and there's so much more value because you're created in his image. So if he does that for those, imagine what he could do for you. Verse 31, Jesus says, So do not worry. Now I take issue with this here. Because you know what, like the worst thing you could tell someone that is stressed out and anxious and, and, and worrying about something, you know what the worst thing you can tell them? Don't worry. I've tried this with my wife. It doesn't work. Let me just give you some marriage and relational advice, or, or you know, maybe you're not married yet, but you have a significant other. They come home, they had a bad day at work. They're stressed out about a child because of a report card or something the teacher said about them. Or maybe they went to the doctor and there's some health issues they're concerned about. And they're venting about it and kind of caught up in it. Don't just say, don't worry about it. Right? Don't worry. Be fine. That's not a good answer. Right? Because why? Because it comes across as insensitive. It comes across about not being empathetic, about you not caring. It comes across as about, about like you not listening to them and just kind of dis being dismissive. Yet, that's what Jesus says here. Wherever you're at, whatever you came in here today dealing with, Jesus would look at you and say, don't worry. Why is it that okay? Because I get in trouble for saying that same thing. <laughs> See, it's different if the person saying it knows something that you don't know. For example... My neighbor, who just only moved in a couple months ago, he invited me over to watch the Colts game today at 1 o'clock. And um, I told him I probably wouldn't be there at 1, I might be there a little later. But let's pretend that, that he recorded it for me. And, and I got over that like 5. And he watched it, but then we're watching the recording together, and, and it's getting towards the end of the game. And, and I'm like, oh man, why did the Colts let the Cowboys come back? I, and I'm on the edge of my seat. Are they going to lose it and blow it again? Like, what's, what's happening? And I'm just anxious and I'm, I'm engaged. And I look over at him and he's just relaxed and laying, you know, like not anxious and not stressed at all. Why? He knows how it ends, right? He knows something that I don't know. Now, what's interesting, I just learned this after he invited me over, is that he's actually a Cowboys fan. <laughs> and so <laughs> this might not turn out well. But when Jesus says to you, do not worry, he has the authority to say that because he's the author of your life. He's the creator of you and everything that you're going to be dealing with, right? He knows, the Bible says he knows the beginning from the end. And so when Jesus looks at you and, and looks at where you are in your situation and says, do not worry, I've got this, he can say that because he has the authority and you can trust him. In that. And so Jesus says, do not worry worry saying what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear for the pagans run after all these things and your heavenly father knows that you need them your heavenly father knows as i was preparing um i really felt like the lord say that just someone here this isn't today is not about peace for you but you just need to hear that god knows what you're going through god knows where you're at right now i have uh three children that are that are adopted and and one of the things um the adopted children sometimes deal with is, you know, usually they have trauma early in their life or they had needs that weren't met. And, and so some kids that were, have trauma early in life, um, they have a real hard time trusting others. They have a hard time loving others. And the reason is because they had needs early on that weren't met. And so they, they grow up and, and they're just very independent naturally. It's like hardwired into their brain. Now, if you want kids to be like to learn to care for themselves and to dress and put deodorant on and brush your teeth and just good self-care like that, they got that. That's super easy. Not a challenge at all, right? But when it comes to letting a teacher correct them or, or, or failing and knowing they can trust someone or allowing a, a parent to, to meet their needs for them and they don't have to do it themselves or when they're, hard, when they're having a hard time coming to someone and opening up, like that's really, really hard because what they learn even subconsciously when they were really young, 
is that I have needs not being met, and so I've got to meet them myself. And I, and, and I just felt like the Lord said that, that there is someone here, and you have a really hard time believing that God knows your needs and will meet your needs because of, of your past. And there's been crisis and trauma where you felt like you've had to care for yourself and no one else was there. Maybe you even feel like God wasn't there for you. And what the Lord wants to say to you today is that the, your Heavenly Father knows your needs and He will take care of you. You can trust Him. And if that's you, that's what this morning is all about. About a God that loves you and is for you and is capable of caring for you. And He will meet your needs. So Jesus says your Heavenly Father knows what you need. Verse 33, But seek first His kingdom and His righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Let me define what I mean when I say peace. Because we hear peace and we think different things. Jesus here says that each day is going to have trouble. And so peace does not mean the absence of trouble. Right? We all have trouble. If anyone has ever stood up on a stage or been in a church or any other setting and said, well, if you're just religious enough, if you're just faithful enough, if you do the right things, that everything will be fine and you won't have any trouble or difficulties in life, they were lying to you. Because Jesus himself says... Every day is going to have trouble, so expect it. Don't be shocked by it. Don't be surprised by it, right? That's just the world we live in. So peace is not the absence of trouble. Peace is the presence of Jesus in the midst of your trouble. It's the presence of Christ in the midst of trouble. It's being connected with God, knowing God is there, focusing on God in the midst of the chaos. That's what peace is. That's what Jesus understood. That's why he wants us to understand And so let's unpack this a little bit. Jesus asked this question in verse 28. He said, why do you worry? It's a good question. Think about it. Why do you worry? Like what this morning maybe have you been worrying about? Think about this past week. What caused you to worry? What makes it hard to go to bed at night? If Jesus was standing right here and and asked you, why do you worry? You know, what I I would say is, I'd be like, Jesus, have you seen the news recently? Right? Like, like, have you seen the stock market since October or the election we just had, like the crazy political times or the trajectory of our country? Like, that's reason to worry. Um, Jesus, I have three preteens, 10, 11, and 12-year-old kids. Like, any of you that have preteens, you know, like, there's things they're learning and hearing and seeing and being exposed to, like, and, like, changes are happening, and it's like every day, like, there's reasons to worry. It's crazy and chaotic, and, and there's not a Bible verse about when they should get their first cell phone or when they should get a social media account. Or how much time they should spend watching YouTube videos or playing Fortnite. Like, I worry. I think about that stuff. Like, gosh, how do you deal with that as a, as a parent? Why do you worry? I sometimes worry about, do I have what it takes to do the things that need to be done? You know, do I have what it takes to be, to be the husband my wife Courtney needs? Or to be the parent my children need? Or, or to do the things that are expected of me? When I stand up here, I, I think about like, man, am I being a good steward of the opportunity that I have to, to be up here? Like, like, am I being accurate and, and, and transparent and, and delivering the Word of God and communicating the Word of God rightly? Right? Like, God, every single one of you, God has an agenda for you this morning. There's something He wants to do. Like, you're not just here to go through a, a Sunday church service. Or you're not just here to, because it's your tradition. Right? Like, that's not it. God has something planned for you. And he wants to intersect your life. And for some of you, this is a, this, he wants to transform your life. And you will look back on today and be like, man, I just went for a kid's program or because a neighbor asked me or I was coerced to go there. Or I just thought it was another Sunday, you know. But you're going to look back on like December 16th of this year and be like, man, something changed that day. And the trajectory of your life went off in a different direction because God wants to meet with you. God wants to intersect your life. Like this morning right now, he wants to do those things. And so I think about like in the little small part I have, am I getting in the way of that? Like, I want to get out of the way. I want to let God do his thing. And so am I, am I stewarding the opportunities that I have well and, and rightly? I, I think about those things. What do you worry about? One of the things I've realized as I get older is sometimes, like, more frequently now, like, in the middle of the night, I get up and go to the bathroom. And I've realized that, like, my bladder and my brain are connected. Right? I don't know if you ever have this, but you get up, you go to the bathroom, it's 3 a.m., and you lay back down, and then suddenly you start thinking about stuff. You know, what is it that that makes it hard to go back to sleep in the middle of the night for you? What do you worry about? And so Jesus asks this question, why do you worry? And then, you know, one of the key ideas he introduces here is is, is like, be like a bird, right? He's like, like, look at the birds. He doesn't say be like one. He says, observe the birds. I wonder why he says that. 
What is it, Jesus, about the birds that you want us to observe? Maybe it's that the birds have different perspective than we do. Like we get so caught up in what's going on right around us, but the birds, they see us and they see all that stuff, but they also see so much more that we oftentimes don't see. It Maybe it's, you know, to observe the bird, we've got to look up, like we've got to take our eyes off of the horizontal things that are going on. We look up and, and we not only see the birds, but we start to think about like the God that's up there, our Father that is in heaven, our Father that is above us, our, our Father that is within us, our God that is for us. Like, and that changes things when you start becoming aware of that and thinking about that. Like maybe there's something there with, with peace where he says, observe the birds, look up at the birds, because they, they get something that we don't get. So here's what I want you to do. Stand up with me for a minute. Just, just stand up, all right? All right, here's what I want you to picture, because I, I, here's, here's the idea I think that Jesus feels like, uh, like he wants us to get with when we think about birds, all right? So, so there's you, right? Like there's you where you are in life. All right, like that, that's the dot on, on, the, on the slide here. And, and, and what I'm going to have you do is I want to have you do a full circle, like 360 degrees all the way around. And I want you to pay specific attention to who is right around you, like who's in front of you and who's beside you and then who's right behind you. Okay, so let's just do a full circle and, and pay attention to, to who's right beside you. All right. Okay. What those people represent is the, the, the circle up here, which is the problems and trouble in your life. All right? So those people right around you. Now, some of you, yeah, as Tony wanted me to clarify, it's a metaphor, right? right? Some of you I see shaking your head, like pointing at your spouse. or you know, Now, if you had a fight on the way to church this morning or it's a stressful morning, don't be like pointing at me like, I told you you were the problem. Right, like that's. But see, here's what happens. In life, all of those things that stress us out, all those things that cause us to worry, the, the enemies and the troubles and the problems and the challenges, right? all of those things are like right around us almost all the time. At least it feels that way. You wake up in the morning, it's the first thing you're thinking about. You go to work and there's difficult coworkers and managers and, and school and they're there and, and they're hard teachers and you come home and there's family and, and challenges and, and you, last thing before you go to bed, you're thinking about those things. It's like they're right around you all the time everywhere you go. And almost, sometimes it's almost like those things are suffocating. Like they, they just move in and they suffocate you and then they just consume you. And, and so many of us, those things rob us of our peace, don't they? All throughout the day, our peace is getting taken from us and robbed from us. So here's what I want you to do. We're going to do another circle. And this time, I want you to look beyond the people that are right there next to you. All right? And so, so look several rows back or across the room, right? Just look beyond the people that are right there and, look at, and, and see some faces and some things around the room that are beyond that. Okay? So let's just do another circle one more time here and look far, further away. Okay. All right, did you see, you saw some different things probably, right? Now what changed? You didn't change. Like you were in the exact same spot, right? You, you're, you're you, you're there. The, the things that represent the troubles and problems in your life, they were still there. They were still right around you. But your perspective changed. Your perspective changed. And when Jesus says, observe the birds, I think he's talking about that because they have a different perspective than we do. And so the second circle up here are the things that I believe that the birds see and that Jesus is trying to get us to see that he saw that allowed him to have peace in the midst of the craziness and the challenges of life. And so here's my question. Which of those circles are you focused on? Which consumes you? Because whichever one of those you think about most often, that will determine the level of peace in your life. Whichever one consumes you and you give your attention to most frequently, that will be what you will live out of. You can have a seat. And so if you are consumed with and focusing on and constantly thinking about the troubles and the challenges and the enemies and the hardships in your life, then that will be what you will live from and you will not have peace. Yet, you may be in the exact same situation and you could look and instead be focused on God who is your healer and your provider and your creator and your redeemer, your friend, almighty, he, the beginning and the end, right? That You focus on that. The challenges and problems are still there. I'm not saying ignore those. We still got to deal with them. But life is different, isn't it? Because peace is not the absence of that inside circle. But it's being focused on and being aware of the presence of God in the midst of the trouble. 
There's a story I want to end with here in the Old Testament. It's, it's uh, in 2 Kings 6, and it's about Elisha, one of the prophets uh, in the Old Testament. And, and Israel is just being dominant, right, at this point in history in, on the battlefield. King of Israel, like he's got his game together and, and all that. And, and the enemies are getting really frustrated. And there's one specific one, King of Aram, who's like, man, why is it the King of Israel always seems to know where we're going to be and is, is defeating us constantly? And he's really frustrated. And, and one of his, his people tell him, well, it's because there's this guy named Elisha that hears from God and then he gives like insight to the king and the king responds to that and acts on it. And he always has the upper hand. And so this king gets really frustrated. He's like, okay, well, we're going to go take this guy out. And so in 2 Kings 6, it talks about how, how while Elisha and his people were sleeping one night, the king, this enemy king, comes and surrounds them with chariots and horses. So check this out. This is 2 Kings 6. All right, in verse 14, it talks about how the strong force of chariots and horses comes and, and, and they surround the city Elisha is sleeping in. Verse 15, when, the servant, when Elisha's servant gets up, he goes outside in the morning and he looks out there and there's this army with horses and chariots that have surrounded the city. I love what he says. Look at this. Oh no, my Lord, what shall we do? Don't we respond the same way? You go to the doctor and you hear something you hadn't heard before about your health and you start freaking out. Oh no, what are we going to do? You get laid off. You get a bill that's unexpected. Right? Your spouse you're just having a really hard time in your marriage right now. Your child is rebelling, rejecting you, or maybe rejecting some of the things you've, you tried to instill in them when they were young. Right? And, and you freak out. And you say the exact same thing. The servant did. Oh no, what are we going to do? And it's because it, the servant was all focused on that, that inner circle stuff, wasn't he? That first circle stuff. That he saw, like literally, he saw an enemy that surrounded the city, and he was thinking, we're not going to survive. We are not going to make it through this day. We are going to die today. That, that's like exactly what he was thinking, right? Check this out. Verse 16. Here's Elisha's response. Do not, don't be afraid. Sounds a lot like Jesus, doesn't it? Saying, don't worry. Don't be afraid. The prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them, and Elisha prayed, open his eyes, Lord, so that he may see. That's been the prayer that I've had more so than any other prayer for this morning. Is that wherever you're at in your journey with Jesus and whatever it is you're dealing with in life, and I know some of you are dealing with really hard stuff, is that your eyes would be open in the same way the servants were. So Elisha prays, open his eyes, Lord, so that he may see. So that he may see there's more than just this circle of stuff, this enemy that's surrounding us. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. See, here's the thing. The situation didn't change. They were still surrounded by the enemy, this, this opposing force that seemed overwhelming. And, and, and it's not like Elisha, you know, there was something different, like, right? Like he didn't magically change the situation. But what was different? His perspective was different. The servant saw that inside circle. And it freaked him out and it consumed him and it overwhelmed him. Elisha knew there was more because he knew God was present. And Elisha was at peace. See, peace doesn't mean the absence of enemies in your life. That's not what peace is. But peace is being aware of the presence of God. It's knowing that Jesus is present in the midst of your enemies. Elisha got that. And he prayed that his servant would get that. And my prayer in God's heart for this morning is that you would get that as well. And I know for some of you, Christmas this year, this season, this month has been a hard month. I know for some of you, there's, there's health things and there's financial struggles that are making it difficult. For some of you, there, there's strained relationships. You know, that when you, th in, in a year ago in 2017 at Christmas, when you thought about Christmas this year, or six months ago when you said, man, Christmas is coming up in six months, I, and you were looking forward to what it's going to be like, it's not looking like that now. There's a loved one maybe not even there. And this is just a really difficult season for you. And what God wants you to know is even in the midst of a difficult season is you can still have peace. Because peace doesn't mean we don't have difficult seasons. We all have them. But peace means we're aware and focused on and connected with Christ in the midst of a difficult season.